Ever since the rumor mill started churning back in late 2023 with whispers of precious Xbox exclusives going to rival platforms, the core Xbox fan base has been in disarray. I know, I certainly didn't help matters, reporting that Microsoft were looking at what plans would be needed to release Bethesda's newest spacefaring RPG Starfield for PlayStation 5 at some point in the future. This was swiftly followed with reporting from Tom Warren, senior editor at The Verge, that Indiana Jones from Machine Games was also under consideration for a future multi-platform release. The Xbox fanbase were not happy. Microsoft and the Xbox team responded to the building uproar, hosting a special edition of the official Xbox podcast, where they laid it out in black and white. Initially, four first-party games would be going to traditionally rival platforms with the long-term health of Xbox in mind. It's led to a lot of confusion and guesswork from many. Why those four games in particular? Why make this experiment at all? I'll come back to that. That long-term health, according to Phil Spencer, meant the following. The long-term health of Xbox means a growing platform, our games performing, building the best platform for creators and reaching as many players as we can. What it didn't mean, if I were to take that statement at face value, was selling the most consoles or selling the most copies of the next big game, but it did mean growth overall, more players, more games, more creators. Since then, Phil did an interview with Polygon during GDC where he ruminated on how the math of making a game has definitely changed as he discussed the costs of development continuing to rise and the losses being felt throughout the game industry. He discussed the rise of PC handhelds like the Steam Deck, the ROG Ally and the Lenovo Legion Go and how he wished he could make them more Xbox. Hell, he even talked about breaking down the walled gardens and closed platforms that are and always have been how video game consoles operate, theorizing on the existence of other digital stores on these devices in the future. To me, it felt a little like Phil wasn't just being his usual savvy and candid self, but that there was also a degree of prepping with these talking points being laid out for the wider masses to start to at least try to understand the winds of change blowing in our general direction. The way things work are going to change, it suggested. They have to change. There have been plenty of opinion pieces from a variety of video game pundits, from an excellent fact-based write-up from Ains over at Season Gaming, to a more thoughtful and conversational train of thought piece from Jez Corden over at Windows Central. Even I have dabbled previously, empathising with Xbox fans who are furious at this new direction, with members of the Xbox era team offering their own rebuttal, under the likely entirely true premise that Xbox don't really care about console wars. The central theme of many of these pieces has been trying to communicate and understand the why of Microsoft's decision making lately, pulling apart at the inner workings of AAA game development, costs versus return on investment, and balancing the traditional way the console market has always operated, with a focus on exclusive software pushing players to buy the subsidized box to play those games. To change all of this after 30 plus years of status quo is breaking everyone's brains and all of these conversations and opinion pieces are trying to do one thing, understanding the old way of doing things when stacked up against this new and uncertain era. Fact versus fiction. Microsoft are making many of these disruptive, long-term focused decisions now to be better positioned in the future. This isn't new from Microsoft, of course. They have a tendency to always try new things and push the industry in new ways, sometimes to great success and sometimes to their own detriment. It's one of the reasons I value what Xbox as a platform brings to gaming. As they now look ahead to the future, they're making moves in directions that cause many die-hard Xbox fans concern. We've learned a lot about the video game market in recent years and some of the reasonable fact-based assumptions that I think the team at Xbox have made are as follows. Console customers are locked to their platform due to the rise of digital libraries. 
Phil Spencer has been on record before about how losing the Xbox One generation was the worst one to have lost, because this was truly the point that console owners started to build massive digital libraries. Is the consumer that swapped from Xbox 360 to PlayStation 4 going to just throw away a decade's worth of games they own to main an Xbox Series X as their new platform? It certainly hasn't panned out that way, has it? Is the average current Xbox customer going to swap their platform of choice and effectively walk away from all their games on Xbox because Microsoft publish some exclusive games elsewhere later down the line? Microsoft probably think this is unlikely. The console market isn't growing, and it hasn't been for a very long time. The console market is flat and has been for years and arguably decades. The biggest selling console of all time, Sony's PlayStation 2, sold 155 million units, or 160 million according to exiting Sony boss Jim Ryan, who perhaps just wants to deny the Nintendo Switch that title of best selling console as it's approaching a very similar number. There's no growth there, and instead we see Sony and Microsoft fighting over the same sized pie, with Nintendo enjoying the fact that many gamers treat the Switch as an additional purchase alongside their main platform. Everybody else's customer is your success state. You can't succeed unless you draw in customers from other publishers and other platforms. And because you're not finding new customers with the games that you're building, everybody's kind of fighting over the same size pie. Gen Z gamers aren't buying $70 games. Surprise! We're old now, and while our way of doing things, and that is pre-ordering and buying games on release day, still has some value, younger players just aren't doing the same thing. Not only that, but the games that they do play regularly, they're available everywhere and have been around for years and usually are completely free to play. Matt Piscatella on Twitter said, the US video game hardware market peaked in 2008. Shares of console purchases is increasingly swinging to older folks. Zoomers care less about console than prior gens and alphas may never care. Every video game company is thinking about expansion beyond console. They have to. These new and upcoming gaming consumers aren't taking part in the my plastic box is better than your plastic box rhetoric that certain content creators, Twitter bubbles and the mainstream games media engage. Why? Because they can play Fortnite or Minecraft or Call of Duty on their phone, tablet, PC or console and those games don't care what device they or their friends are on. The biggest games in the world, outside of admitted outliers like GTA Online, are available everywhere. Gen Z and younger generations expect mobility. They expect to be untethered, unplugged. So when I see live service games like Sea of Thieves coming to PlayStation 5, I totally understand the why. You remove the barriers of access, you grow the game's audience, and you give more value to the IP. And IP value is important here. If we look at Grounded, for example, it's getting a TV show. So of course, having the game available in more places helps grow the value of that IP, so that when that TV show hits, you're not reliant on only Xbox and PC players engaging with it. Hi-Fi Rush, the incredible new franchise developed by Tango Gameworks, was a wonderful surprise for the Xbox brand. Do they leave this unmarketed, shadow-dropped game as it is, or do they try to grow its value by getting it in the hands of more players? If I was in charge of making money as a business for Xbox, I know what I'd think about doing. Pentamon, a more niche title, shows to me at least, and this is entirely conjecture at this point, the desire to value your creators and talent. Think about it this way. Do you want to keep this super niche passion project sitting on the smallest platform, Xbox and PC, or do you keep the legendary game designer Josh Sawyer and team happy by publishing the game everywhere? Any creator making games, regardless of platform, wants them to be played by as many people as possible. I can't help feel that talent retention plays a small part in all these changes too. Gen Z players do buy subscriptions. 
Pretty much everything is subscription-based nowadays, and for good reason. Having regular and known income month on month is vastly preferable for most companies, and Microsoft paved the way in gaming by launching Xbox Game Pass, which it has since bolstered from a content pipeline perspective with acquisitions like Bethesda and Activision Blizzard, promising a regular slate of great games, including behemoths like Call of Duty. For Microsoft, Game Pass means more than just delivering value to their existing customers. The real play is expanding the access routes available for every member of the possible audience, lowering the barrier for entry at a reasonable price, making traditional console gaming available to more people that may be priced out, especially in this economy. According to a report by Zawara's Subscription Economy Index, subscription businesses have consistently grown revenues about five to eight times faster than traditional businesses. This trend is reflected across multiple sectors, including software, entertainment, and publishing. When you look at the model's overall success across music with services like Spotify and video streaming with Netflix and Disney+, it's understandable that Microsoft believe in the general consumer confidence that exists for subscriptions. With Microsoft being the first to push the gaming industry in this direction with Game Pass, we've already seen Nintendo and Sony follow suit, albeit tentatively. Despite the incredible value Game Pass provides to most Xbox console gamers today, its growth has stalled. Why? A complete slump in console sales, particularly across Europe, is one reason, but the other is that, and this is conjecture on my part, Microsoft have already sold the subscription to all the hardcore gamers that want it. The challenge for Team Xbox now is how to convince those wider masses to buy in. And quick tangent, honestly, Xbox, saying play it day one on Xbox Game Pass doesn't mean anything to the average consumer. If you want to grow the subscription base, try some adverts targeting normal people. Mums and dads, I guarantee you, who resent paying £60 a pop for the latest games. They don't really know what play it day one on Xbox Game Pass actually means. There's been a lot of passionate debate about the future of video game exclusives and their role in this industry going forward. PlayStation has made a huge name for itself in having the biggest and highest rated exclusives in the industry. Xbox have been playing catch up for what feels like forever, and even though the Xbox platform has great exclusive games, the general mainstream games industry often seems hell-bent on fueling console wars by pretending it doesn't, constantly pitting one game against the other, endless list wars, and the constant chase for negative engagement makes an already tricky uphill battle for a bigger slice of the pie even more difficult for Microsoft. In Microsoft's eyes, the subscription service of Xbox Game Pass is the new exclusive, and in itself, any subscription service worth its salt is one fueled by exclusive content. It explains Xbox going from garage band to core pillar within Microsoft that makes more money than Windows, and in my eyes, explains the frankly enormous acquisition spree that results in Team Xbox owning multiple previously independent studios alongside the purchase of ZeniMax and Activision Blizzard. Armed with an enormous first-party development network and an absolute gamut of desirable, valuable gaming IP. I mean, seriously, there's so much coming. Hellblade 2 just got a bunch of previews and it looks amazing, Gears 6 is being teased, and that's not to mention updates on Fable, Avowed, Towerborn, South of Midnight, and State of Decay 3. And that's just ones I'm remembering. Team Xbox are now able to achieve a lot more than they could have ever imagined, and it's clear they're now eyeing up a more synergistic approach, focusing on multiple platforms beyond their own. Due to the sheer size of Microsoft Gaming now, it's an understandable push for growth that no platform holder has ever had opportunity for before. That multi-platform experiment I mentioned earlier? I expect this investigation into broader multi-platform releases to go way beyond a mere four games, and you shouldn't be surprised if and when it does. Xbox isn't leaving you behind, but they are moving forward. Of course, for many in this industry struggling with this new way of doing things, none are suffering more than the Xbox faithful. From the normal fans who've just always appreciated the differences and services that Xbox brought to gaming as a platform, to the more evangelical out there 
you know, those fighting the good fight on social media, throwing out W's and L's based on the colour of the Metacritic box of whatever platforms exclusive has recently come out and celebrating or defending their consoles perceived victories or defeats. Phil Spencer and team have made it very clear that Xbox as a platform isn't going anywhere. President of Xbox Sarah Bond said there's some exciting stuff coming out in hardware that will be shared this holiday. Many will point to the leaks surrounding the white, adorably digital Xbox Series X, but I'm not so sure. That doesn't scream exciting to me, at least. A handheld Xbox, however. Phil Spencer can't stop thinking about it, huh? Neither can I. Indeed, Sarah Bond also discussed the future of Xbox hardware beyond this generation and into the next, focusing on the largest technical leap you will have ever seen. If you think back to the reveal of Project Scorpio, which became the Xbox One X, it was made a good 18 months before hitting retail shelves. Something to think about. The point, I think, is to underline to all the existing fans of Xbox that everything they love about the platform, from the best-in-class service and subscriptions, parental controls, and of course, the most important thing, awesome video games, isn't going anywhere. They're going to continue to make Xbox the best place, outside of super powerful PCs, to play Xbox content. Try, if you can, to disconnect your brain from the traditional console market way of doing things. Rather than duking it out for supremacy among a user base that isn't growing to obtain hardware leadership in an increasingly connected digital world, instead, Think about a world where your experience is prioritized, where you can choose where to play and on what and with who and how you're going to pay for it. Well, the future of Xbox doesn't sound so bad at all, does it? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit like, hit subscribe, and please ring that bell so that we can let you know when we've got some fresh content. And a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who make Xbox era possible. If you want to become one of those legendary few, head to patreon.com forward slash Xbox era.